I think the story of Prince Philip is a completely extraordinary story, and it's very little known. People have been watching Prince Philip, most people, for most of their lives, but they've seen him as a man who always turned up uh, at the right time in the right uniform and walked one step behind the Queen. But that's basically it. And in retrospect, of course, we regard the Queen's reign as a huge success, undoubtedly. Uh, but if you do regard the Queen's reign as a success, the joint author of that success is the Duke of Edinburgh. And what, what people, I think, today forget is quite where he's come from. You know, he was a, a Greek prince. His grandfather was assassinated. His father, in the year of Prince Philip's birth, was arrested, put on trial, a show trial, uh, and uh, was due to be executed. The family then had to flee uh, the country with the help of the, the British King, George V. They, they stayed on the outskirts of Paris. And before Prince Philip was even 10 years of age, the parents had split up. His father then left his mother. Uh, he went to the south of France. He was a depressive. He had girlfriends down there. His mother had schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and was, was locked up at times, put in an asylum. And Prince Philip then began a peripatetic childhood because his sisters, within the space of about eight months, each of them had married a different German prince of some kind. And so Prince Philip then spent his childhood traveling between his relatives in Germany. That became more difficult with the rise of Nazi Germany and in England. He was sent to Cheam Prep School initially in, in, in England and he was there till he was 12. And at that point, his, one of his sisters, Theodora, who was married to the um, Baden family at Salem, um, where they ran a school, she asked that Prince Philip go to Salem, um, which in some ways was a, a strange decision because it, it was sort of eight months after Hitler had seized power in Germany. But anyway, he went to Germany to this um, boarding school and uh, he was there for two, two, two terms before coming back. And then he was sent up to the north of Scotland where Kurt Hahn, who had founded Salem but had fled to England after the rise of Hitler, he had started this progressive boarding school, um, Gordonston, where Prince Philip was one of the first pupils. He had quite a solitary childhood in that he was at boarding school from the age of eight. His family were all overseas and he was very much left to, to tough it out on his own. He had the great influence of Kurt Hahn, who was his uh, headmaster at Gordonston and was a hugely formative uh, influence for him. But, you know, he never had a home of his own. He didn't have much in the way of family, certainly around him. I, I was shown a visitor's book by his first cousin, Countess Mountbatten, from the 1930s, where he signed his name in the name column, but in the address column, he's put no fixed abode. And I saw that in more than one book. He was conscious that he had no fixed abode. And so, though he was loyal to his parents, for several years when he was coming up to adolescence, he didn't see his mother, no Christmas card, no birthday card, nothing for several years, and his father had disappeared. He had loving sisters, but perhaps the one he loved most, or certainly one of his sisters, was killed in an aeroplane crash. At a single terrible stroke of fate, one of the oldest of Europe's royal families has been almost completely wiped out. An airliner carrying the Grand Duke of Hesse, his wife and babies, struck this chimney in a fog while on its way from Brussels to a wedding in London. It crashed through the factory roof and burst into flame. There was not one survivor. Then his uh, uncle, who was really his kind of godfather, the older brother of Lord Mountbatten, um, Uncle George, he died of cancer in the late 1930s. So his parents had disappeared. His godfather, uncle, died of cancer. His sister had been killed in an aeroplane crash. Uh, and yet he just carried on. And he would not complain about this ever. He was brought up very largely by his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, and his family who were in England, his sisters who were all 20 plus years older than him, lived in Germany. So he's, he had a very dysfunctional and difficult life. So f Lord Mountbatten, Louis Mountbatten, became his, his father figure, effectively, and he was hugely important in, in Philip's life. But he wasn't his father. As he said to me, I had a perfectly good father, perfectly good father, excellent mother. He has spoken very affectionately about them and about his boyhood, um, and he was different. Times were very different then, um, and an upper-class upbringing 
in the in the 1930s is not like any kind of upbringing in 2019. His mother was was the most remarkable person. I mean, before Prince Philip was born, she had acted like a sort of Florence Nightingale type nurse um, on the front during the Balkan Wars, where she set up hospitals. During the Second World War, she was one of the few people to stay on. Or, I mean, one of the few, certainly one of the few members of the royal family to stay on in Athens during the German occupation. She sheltered um, very much, you know, putting herself in jeopardy. She sheltered a Jewish family in her house. She was later awarded by um, Israel the, the, the award of Righteous Among Nations, which was the same award given to Oscar Schindler. Prince Philip was once asked uh, about his mother having saved Jews uh, from the Nazis during the war, and he replied that it was just something that any decent person would do. And I think that gives a real insight into uh, his values um, and, you know, the fact that he just thought this is how people should behave. In, in my own life, I have always tried to reach across the, the boundaries of faith and community to extend a helping hand wherever one might be needed. This was uh, probably ingrained in me at an early age, partly due, I suspect, to my grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece, who had courageously sheltered a Jewish family in her apartment in Athens during the Nazi occupation, and who, incidentally, is buried righteous among the nations in Jerusalem. Um, but she ended her life in Buckingham Palace. She came and lived with the Queen and Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace. A bit eccentric in my view because she dressed as a nun. They knew when she was walking the corridors of Buckingham Palace because her staff told me we could smell the woodbines in the corridor. She would walk along the corridors of Buckingham Palace, drawing on her woodbine, dressed as a nun. I regard that as a bit eccentric, but Prince Philip regarded it as just his mum. And Princess Anne and Prince Charles have wonderful, affectionate memories of her. So Prince Philip's view is, yes, his parents split up. Yes, it was a difficult time in Europe, but, uh, he went to a good school, he'd been to a good school in Germany, he had a good loving family, he just got on with it. That was his view of life, he just got on with it. It was probably because of Mountbatten that Philip went into the Navy. There was a great keenness that Prince Philip was, would, would go into the Navy, although initially he had been keen to go in the RAF. He said that the real passion of his life had been flying. look at the record, I think he spent as much time in the air as you would have done during a professional career in the RAF. He went on flying till he was, you know, uh, well beyond middle age. Uh, and he flew every type of aircraft. That was one of his passions. If he had done, it's very likely he would have been killed in the Battle of Britain. But anyway, he, he joined the Navy. He was a, a student at Dartmouth Naval College, and he was 18, blonde, beautiful, um, and, and asked to look after and entertain um, Elizabeth and her sister Margaret. The whole history of, of the Philip-Elizabeth romance is fascinating, of course. One, because it began when they were so young, but, but, but also because Philip is very, very well connected. I mean, we talk a lot about his impecunious childhood, the father, a dissolute princeling who squandered the family resources on the gaming tables at Monte Carlo, and the mad mother who ended up as a nun. But Philip was very high born, well born, in many ways, better credentials, if you like, than his wife. They met on a handful of occasions um, during childhood because they were both sort of distant cousins in the wider sort of European royal family circle. Uh, their most significant sort of early meeting um, took place in 1939 um, when Prince Philip was a cadet at Dartmouth, a naval cadet at Dartmouth, and the, the royal family was sent on a visit. Um, and so there was King George VI and the Queen and his two daughters, the elder of whom was Princess Elizabeth. As the royal yacht Victoria and Albert glides into the mouth of the River Dart, memories must be revived for His Majesty. For well, the King himself was a cadet at the Royal Naval College in the years before the Great War. Later in the afternoon, each member of the royal family plants a tree in commemoration of this visit. 
the king a purple beech, the queen a golden beech, and Princess Elizabeth a white beam. There was an outbreak of mumps um, at the college at the time, so the two princesses were, were kept apart and were sent to the captain's house where they were to be entertained by one of the cadets. And it was Louis Mountbatten, Dickie Mountbatten, who's Prince Philip's uncle, who spotted an opportunity here. And, and he was the king's ADC, and he also engineered it that his nephew would be the one who would entertain the princesses, look, look after them and so on. And they had a lovely time with him. And I think that Elizabeth at that point, actually, even as a 13-year-old, fell, fell hugely for this, this very good-looking older boy. Of his age group, he was certainly one of the, the, the you know, the best-regarded young officers in the Navy. He was, he was brave, quick-thinking. Serving in the Second World War with distinction, mentioned in dispatches, being at the surrender of Japan. Hesitant and nervous, she commits who signs the obituary to 2,605 years of an unbroken dynasty, during which no foreign troops had occupied Japanese soil. He was decorated during the war. He was a hero. He had a good war, uh, there's no doubt about it. He was mentioned in dispatches, he was brave. Um, he fought with distinction in, in the Royal Navy. Um, and he, he is, of course, part of a, a dwindling generation. And all of that, I think, has very largely been forgotten. And it wasn't actually until about 1943 when he stayed at Windsor during the war. It was one Christmas where he had basically nowhere else to go um, other than to his cousins, the, the, the British royal family at Windsor. And there it was observed that there was a, you know, a definite flirtation going on between the two of them. And she maintained the friendship throughout her teens and her parents were not wholly pleased with it, particularly when she eventually announced that she was in love with him because he was a he was a bit of a wayward prince and he he had a lot of German connections and after the war that was highly undesirable. Um, but Elizabeth was absolutely adamant that she loved him. There was more to it than, 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 than the passion that drew them together. I mean, Philip was, was a product of his age in many respects. I think it's a lot about going through a war and I, I think that shaped his personality and his ability to cope with anything, pretty much. I mean, if you've been at sea, at war, my guess is, as someone who's never been at war, is that you can pretty much cope with anything. And I think it was that part of his character that appealed hugely to Princess Elizabeth. Lord Mountbatten was a notorious marriage maker, and there's no doubt at all that he was excited by the possibility of his nephew, uh, Prince Philip of Greece, becoming the consort to the potential Elizabeth II Queen of England. But Prince Philip himself always denied that um, Lord Mountbatten was a, a marriage broker of any kind. At North Holt Aerodrome, our cameraman meets Princess Alice of Greece. The princess is the mother of Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, formerly Prince Philip of Greece. She has come to stay with her mother, the Dowager Marchioness of Milford Haven. Before leaving Paris, Princess Alice refused to confirm or deny the possibility of a marriage between Philip and Princess Elizabeth. The, the king and queen, they were won over um, because although he was boisterous and a little bit cheeky and he had plenty of sort of appealing sort of traits that he liked, he, he, he admired his forthrightness, his courage, his plain speaking. When Prince Philip and Princess Elizabeth became engaged, uh, the question came about, what are we going to call him? You know, he's going to cease to be Prince Philip of Greece because he's going to assume British nationality. And he had to have a name, what would the name be? Of course, he was born with the Danish royal family name. His, his father was of, of that descent, and that was Schleswig Holstein Sonderberg Glucksberg, was hardly going to go down very well with the British public so, so, so soon after the war. So it was decided that a better name for him to take would be that of his 
mother's family. They chose the name Mount Batten because it had a British ring. Though, of course, until the First World War, the family name had been Battenberg, but it was now Mount Batten. So they took this name, even though it was the mother's side of his family, rather than his father's side, that became the family name. Prince Philip was happy with that, and he married as Philip Mountbatten, and ceased to be uh, a Greek prince, and indeed he says he didn't become a British prince for 10 years. And now they are man and wife. The princess had been in the abbey for nearly an hour. What followed the service was the ornate pageantry of a state occasion. It showed that this was no ordinary wedding, but that of a king's daughter. During the early years of their marriage, they lived in Malta, and that was where he was stationed, and that was always said to be, you know, their happiest time. The Queen, though she was performing duties, was leading the life, an almost normal life, almost like a, a you know, the young married naval couple, like normal naval people, as normal as you can be if you're a member of the royal family. They had their first family, Prince Charles and Princess Anne, before the Queen became Queen, in the end of the 1940s, beginning of the 1950s, when Prince Philip was enjoying a very successful career in the Royal Navy and moving rapidly up to become a senior figure in the Royal Navy. Several people said that had he stayed in the Navy, he would have almost certainly become First Sea Lord. Lord Lewin, who was a colleague of his in the Navy and went on to become the head of the Navy, said that Prince Philip would undoubtedly have become the head of the Navy uh, and indeed possibly the whole armed services, as his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, had done. And uh, that would have been impossible. The, the press would have said it was nepotism. You know, it would, it would never have happened. They would have expected a good 20 years or so of, of relatively free and um, unobserved life. And, and they had a lovely time. And then suddenly the king got ill. Prince Philip had to give up his naval career, which was, I think he said later, you know, one of the the most wretched things he had to do. Um, and then the king died, and Prince Philip was essentially then in a, in a kind of prison, I think he saw himself. The moment the queen was told of her father's death, Prince Philip was there. He was the one who delivered the news to her. And from then on, you know, he took her under his wing, if you like. He was the person who supported her through that terribly difficult time. Everything changed and his world did change. He had a naval career that he had to put on hold. He had now no set role. What was his part? What part did he have to play? And I thought it took him a while to evolve the role. Those were, I think, trying times for him. Here is a man who had a career ahead of him at which he excelled, which he loved. As a naval officer, he could have gone a long, long way, but he gave it up because she became queen and he needed to be her consort, to walk two paces behind her. And it's not an easy job being number two, always being a couple of yards behind, being called your royal highness when your wife is your majesty. Can't be easy. Queen moves to her chair of estate, assisted by her six maids of honor. And there had been an expectation, I think, from Prince Philip, certainly from members of his family, the Mountbatten side of his family, that the, the house would take the name of the father. As in the case of Queen Victoria, uh, the, the house became the house of Saxe Coburg, as in Prince Albert's family name. Uh, but that wasn't the case this time round. Uh, the idea was to stick with the name the House of Windsor. Um, his uncle, Louis Mountbatten, had sort of tried to declare that the House of Mountbatten now reigns, and this was quickly stamped upon. Um, Prince Philip hadn't been keen on Mountbatten either, but wanted at least some recognition of his Edinburgh name, his newly acquired sort of Dukedom of Edinburgh, to be somehow attached to the royal family name. But that was um, rejected as well. So the royal family stayed as it was, and Prince Philip felt utterly sort of pushed to one side, really. And he said, what am I? No more than a bloody amoeba. So I think life was difficult for him at times, and I think he felt that the establishment were against him a lot of that time. It was understandable that people felt it should stay as the House of Windsor. The Second World War had only ended seven years before. 
Winston Churchill was the Queen's first Prime Minister. He had been a friend of her father's. He was her senior advisor. He wasn't even allowed to call his children by his own name. Um, he wanted his children to be called Mountbatten uh, for obvious reasons, and he was told, no, that couldn't happen. And I think that did create tension within the household, and it was a difficult time for him. There's no denying it. In fact, he admitted as much. I, I said to him, you know, when the Queen became Queen, he said, everything changed. I said, but there were people telling you what to do. He said, no, there were people telling me what not to do. For the Queen, her role was clear, and by every account, the Queen was remarkably assured. Age 25, 26, she suddenly found herself as a sovereign, but she stepped into the role as to the manor born, which she was. And where was Prince Philip? What was he to do? But he said, nobody told me. They just said, keep out. And he had quite a frustrating time, I think, evolving a role for himself. So those early years, I think, were, were difficult years. One of the crucial things he did, she came to the throne, you know, very young, very shy, very ill at ease in, in, in public. And, and he was incredibly good and a useful foil for her when out on walkabout. If he saw her in some sort of, you know, sticky conversation, he would saunter up and make some sort of quip that would quickly lighten the mood and, and, and allow things to sort of progress. As he said to me, you know, I've spent my life going down lines, shaking hands with people, and I've made it my policy to try and get at least one person in that line to laugh because you arrive, they're all standing there in a row, they're feeling awkward, you want to relax people. So how do you do it? You say hello and you, you make a little joke. He's always accused of making these terrible gaffes. He even coined a word for it. It's dontopodology, which is the art of putting his foot into his mouth. And then sister, Melody Wyatt, and our staff nurse, Roxanne, of oh. course, yes. Where'd you come from, Roger? Philippines. Philippines, half empty. <laughs> <laughs> You're all here. <good. laughs> he has come out with some corkers over the years. On a royal tour of Australia, the Duke asked Aborigines if they still threw spears at one another. And he may have this image of being bluff and, you know, tough and politically incorrect and gaff prone, but that's what he's like at all. He's actually a, a sensitive person. He's sensitive to other people. And he said to me once, I, I can't face it. If I'm going on a foreign tour and I see they're going to be at the British press there, my heart sinks because I know all they're waiting for, it's a five-day trip, all they are waiting for is the so-called gaff. As one of the dreaded um, press hacks that uh, wrote about and has written about Philip over many years and um, often wrote about his, his so-called gaffes, I do feel a, a, a tinge of sort of regret about some of them because clearly they weren't gaffes. Um, they were amusing, they were riot sides that were beaten up in the, in the journalistic parlance to make a good story, to make a headline. And I imagine you weren't even born then anyway, so I don't know what we know about it. People do find the gaffes amusing. Um, I think the majority of people uh, find somebody who's in the public eye saying what they really think quite refreshing and can connect with that. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to declare this place, well, closed, actually. <laughs> and I honestly don't think that in all those gaffes that he supposedly made, that he really offended anybody. <laughs> that a lot of these so-called gaffes were deliberate, that they were icebreakers by Prince Philip to try and change the dynamic of a situation. Most people that the royals meet, and particularly the Queen and Philip, are incredibly nervous. They're a bundle of nerves, they can't speak, they don't know what to say, they get their P's and Q's all muddled up, and Philip's job, part of his job, has been to put them and the Queen at their ease. And one way he's found of doing it is humour. And it might be a wry aside, it might be a funny face, but it has worked over the years. Unfortunately, the side effect of all this has been the press has sort of focused a lot at these gaffes and blown them up to the extent where Philip became extremely self-conscious about them, uh, anxious about being seen as, as a fool or embarrassing people. Um, and it sort of changed the way he became um, in public, which was in many ways a great shame. People who work with him or who've worked with him have always said that it's very much done 
to break the ice, make people feel at their ease. He's not out there to offend anyone. And if he does so inadvertently, I think he's always very apologetic. I think over the years, Prince Philip has been very badly misrepresented by the press. He he has always spoken his mind. I mean, you know, there are, there are, there's a good Prince Philip and there's a bad Prince Philip. The, 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 the good one is the man who has worked his socks off for to, to make life better for an awful lot of people, you know, for young people, um, for wildlife, for conservation, for all of that. But there's also a, a, another Prince Philip who can be a bully, who can reduce grown men to tears, who is intolerant and bad-tempered and throws things. I think has often jousted with the media. Um, he, he tires of us very quickly. And I'm not just talking about the, 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 the newspapers here. It, it, it equally applies to television and, and broadcasters. I mean, he can be famously short-fused with uh, interviewers, as we know. I think it's fair to say that Prince Philip has a bit of a short fuse um, and is sometimes impatient. And that says a lot about his character. He's just keen to get things done. There was an occasion a couple of years ago where he was at the RAF club celebrating some sort of Battle of Britain memorial. Um, he was with the Duke of Cambridge and the Earl and Countess of Wessex. And they were all lined up in uniforms, looking very smart, ready to have a photograph taken. And as the photographer, you know, put everyone in their positions, um, the Duke was seen to say on camera and heard to say, just take the picture. Well, I think, you know, I think his, his, his sensitivity is, is occasionally apparent. I mean, he, he, he reacts to things, he gets annoyed. Um, but perhaps the public and the press are looking on, um, just sort of sees this as a sort of sign of irritation or anger or, or rudeness. Um, but I think he is a, a, a sensitive man. But at the same time, he has these deep uh, reserves of courage and, 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 and sort of get on with it resilience um, that has seen him through and, and, and allowed him to just carry on. I mean, he's into his 90s, he working, you know, a full week, really. And it's quite remarkable, really. He's, he's been doing that for, was doing that for well over 60 years. I don't think there's any doubt that the British people uh, are aware of the role, vital role he's played in the last 60 years, which is a great benefit to Britain as a whole. There have long been rumours that Prince Philip was unfaithful to, uh, to the Queen and that he had a series of girlfriends. As with anyone in the spotlight, there have been rumours of dalliances over the years, but it's always been heavily denied by uh, not just the palace, but also the, the glamorous women involved. And I think it's very easy for anyone you know, who's photographed alongside someone to be made the subject of gossip. Prince Philip was bedeviled by people writing stories about him as a ladies' man. Partly, I think, because he was so incredibly good-looking. I mean, he really was, uh, you know, a, a sort of Greek god people described him as. And if you see pictures of him as a young man, you can see he was devilishly handsome. There have been mutterings about he was too good-looking, too blonde, and um, he's almost certainly going to stray. That was one of the most famous quotes of all. One of the royal private secretaries made this famous remark that he probably won't be faithful. He was in a straight jacket. Uh, once he was married to the Queen. Um, life was, I think, probably pretty intolerable for him at times. The first of these stories concerned a, a lovely lady called Pat Kirkwood, who I got to know. She was a principal boy in pantomime, and she was a great review artist, famously had the most beautiful legs in the world. And I think in all, Prince Philip met her on perhaps four or five occasions in his entire life. But the first or second occasion, they went to a show or he went to see her in her dressing room with an aquarium and a friend and they ended up going for supper to a club and he danced with her and this was seen. So immediately, oh my goodness, he's dancing with this beautiful girl. There had to be something more to it. Uh, they did meet at another royal gala. She was in the line, they shook hands. Oh, what's going on here now? And uh, these stories continued and they infuriated Prince Philip. I know that. There's always been talk, was Prince Philip having affairs or whatever? I mean, I think one doesn't know. I think there are a huge amount of sort of speculation over friendships, which were nothing more than that. John Major's wife, Norma, 
when, of course, if you are the Prime Minister's wife and it's a male Prime Minister, you find yourself sitting next to the Duke of Edinburgh because the Prime Minister sits next to the Queen. So she said, he is the most delightful companion, so amusing. But why that should then be, if, you, if you're being, as it were, charming, people assume you're being flirtatious, uh, and then they assume there's something more to it. It is very, very annoying. One thing is sure, he's, he's never uh, wavered in his support for the Queen, and there was never any question of the marriage not going all the way. Philip himself has professed his innocence for years and years and years. He, his argument has always been that he has never been alone. You know, since 1947, he's had a detective with him throughout his life. If he'd been up to something in 70 years, somebody would have produced some evidence somewhere. They haven't. He didn't. End of story. The early years of marriage have set the seal on the happiness of the princess and her husband. The blessing of children has come not only to enrich their lives, but also to establish securely the line of succession. Prince Charles, the eldest, the firstborn, and Philip had a difficult relationship. There's no doubt about it. Philip expected things of Charles. With Princess Anne, of course, it was an entirely different and much more affectionate relationship. People have got the picture that maybe the Queen and Prince Philip were somehow uncaring parents and unloving. From everybody I've spoken to, and that's a lot of people who knew them at the time, in the late 40s and early 50s, they were modern parents for the age, hands-on. And yes, Princess Anne and Prince Charles went away to boarding school, but that's the way it was done. There was not considered anything cruel or odd or heartless about it. That's the way it was. Uh, the truth is that Prince Philip thought he was doing the right thing, sending his children, his son, to Gordonstoun. He'd been very happy there, thought it was a great school. On arrival, the Duke and his son were received by the chairman of the governors, the kilted Captain Ian Tennant. Next, the headmaster, Mr. Robert Chew, with whom was the warden, Mr. Henry Breton. Thirty years ago, Prince Philip was a boy at Gordonstoun, the main reason why the Queen and he are sending Prince Charles here. But I think my efforts to reach across the boundaries of faith and community may also have been partly due to the fact that the school I went to in the 1960s in Scotland was founded by a remarkable Jewish emigre from Germany, Dr. Kurt Hahn. And uh, I well remember, I well recall being taught at school by, by several Jewish refugees who had fled from Germany with Dr. Hahn in the 1930s. I have forgotten neither their wisdom nor their dignity. Prince Charles didn't like it and decided to send his children to Eton. Uh, Princess Anne wishes she'd gone to Gordonstoun and sent her children to Gordonstoun. Different children work better or less well in certain schools. They then had a kind of second family. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip proudly introduced Prince Andrew. Two more children came along, Prince Andrew and Prince Edward. And, of course, the older two children are the more senior ones. They're more in the public eye. Uh, Prince Andrew and Prince Edward have had a difficult press. I understand my family's view of photographers. Um, and I'm sure you understand my family's view of photographers and the fact that, that we don't all like having our photographs taken. There's nothing I can say or do to, to change that. Um, but in their parents' eyes, they like, admire, and love their children completely. Uh, there was a lot. It is infuriating to them. I know this because I've, I've heard Prince Philip expressing it. The way the whole thing is portrayed, you know, they've turned us into a soap opera. Um, uh, Prince Philip, adamant, we are not celebrities. That's not, you know, we are a family. And in a family, Sometimes things go well, sometimes things go badly. Sometimes marriages go wrong. That's the way the world is. And of course, for them to have three of your children end up you know, with marriages that have failed is distressing as well as disappointing. But that's the way it is. To have a son like Prince Edward going into the Royal Marines and deciding it wasn't for him. And that, one imagines, must have been a sense of great disappointment for Prince Philip. I mean, as a, as a soldier has, himself, and as the Captain General, the honorary man in charge of the Royal Marines, it almost embarrassing for him that his own son couldn't cut it. But that, not, not a bit of it. I mean, he, Edward had nothing but his father's sympathy and understanding. And I thought that told us an awful lot about Philip the father. And he wasn't this domineering, tyr tyrannical figure that he's often portrayed 
in, in the media as being. Um, he's a sensitive man in, in many respects. I think Prince Philip has steered the Queen and the royal family through some incredibly tough experiences. The, the fire at Windsor Castle, for example, he oversaw a lot of the renovations, he chaired the committee. Um, he's obviously very practical and a realist, and so he looks at how he can help or how things can be changed. The Duke of Edinburgh reads all the time, always got a book or more on the go. Uh, usually uh, factual books, non-fiction. Uh, history, that sort of thing, practical books. He's not a, an academic, if you like, but he is very interested by the power of words and ideas. He's the only member of the royal family with a library at Buckingham Palace. So practical, so pragmatic. You know, he used to make jewellery for the Queen. Want a wedding anniversary present? I'll make it for you. When the Prince of Wales's marriage to Princess Diana came under strain, he intervened, as we know, he wrote to her. I've seen the letters that Philip wrote to Diana and I've seen her replies. The letters are illuminating. They are, um, they're unflinching, I'll say that about them, but they're thoughtful, uh, they're provocative, they're intelligent, they're wry, they're very well written and they're affectionate. And yet Philip took it upon himself to try and act as mediator between Charles, Diana and the royal family. And I think he did a pretty good job. He certainly put Diana, if not at her ease exactly, there's no question she misjudged him. She had a view of her father-in-law, which was changed because of the, uh, the gentleness of the correspondence between them. And they were, I think they were very useful in, in defusing a very explosive situation at the time. Diana certainly felt that the whole of Charles's family were against her. But she did recognise that he had extended a hand of friendship. Prince Philip came in for a lot of criticism, as did the Queen, after the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, um, by members of the public who felt that the royal family weren't being demonstrative enough. And what I've always felt and what they've expressed themselves um, is that they very much wanted to protect the two princes. That was their absolute priority as grandparents. And while Harry later said that, you know, perhaps walking behind his mother's coffin was not the right thing for them to have done, at the time, the Duke of Edinburgh suggested he would walk with the boys. If you walk, I will walk with you. And made that decision to walk with the boys that day because he would see it as an opportunity to bring people together, which is exactly what it did do. But it could be a moment of history that's decided by a man who, in theory, is not the head of the royal family. But his influence has been amazing. He cultivated passions, he had enthusiasms in life beyond himself. And uh, he followed them through. What he was interested in, he was really interested in. When he got into uh, carriage driving, he became the expert. He wrote the book, he invented the rules. He followed everything through. He was absolutely a details man. late 40s and early 50s, which was of a very current interest, both in America and here, was, was the interest in UFOs and, and, and sort of people from other, other planets. And Prince Philip had several aquaries which he would send out from Buckingham Palace um, to interview people who had had sort of close encounters. Um, and the more sort of, the more interesting ones or the ones that they felt needed more um, inquisition would be brought back to Buckingham Palace and be interviewed um, by Prince Philip himself, because it was felt that the presence of royalty would sort of act as a sort of truth serum and help to flush out whether, whether, whether in fact they were telling cobblers or not. Lots of people have talked about uh, Prince Philip having godlike qualities, certainly looking like a Greek god in his youth. Um, but uh, one of my favourite stories about him is that he is considered to be some sort of deity in um, the South Pacific nation of Vanuatu, uh, which... Um, revered him so much after his visit there with the Queen in the 1970s that he became the focus of a, a cult-like religion where some villagers decided that he had um, 
been a descendant of their spirit ancestors and I believe the Prince Philip movement may still be in existence and I think he perhaps over the years has continued to stay in correspondence with people on the island. Prince Philip carried out more than 600 uh, solo trips overseas and I think while he was never really able to interfere in politics, um, he has pay, played a very important, uh, if quiet, diplomatic role over the years. He, when the Queen was unable to travel, would go and visit countries, obviously while there would meet heads of state, other senior figures, and he no doubt did a lot to foster good relations within the Commonwealth. There, there is a point at which it, that the world will not support the major uh, species like ourselves. I mean, it simply will, it will collapse, and, and the, what will happen, I imagine, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a terrible thought that, that people, millions of people will go without food, millions of people will go without water. You know, he has been a fantastic modernizer, a fantastic campaigner for wildlife, for conservation, for young people, for playing fields, open spaces. I mean, th there are many, many things that he has, issues that he has got involved with and championed. Where he has managed to find satisfaction in his life, because he's measured it out with handshakes, small talk going down lines, opening buildings, unveiling plaques. That's, that's the life of a, of a royal. But he has had the individual satisfaction of various projects in which he's been involved. The Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme is, of course, the most famous. It has touched the lives of millions of people around the world. That is a great legacy. It's difficult to explain that it's, it's, not, it's not a new idea. I mean, people have been doing this with young people, but they've, everybody's had to invent it. It's like reinventing the wheel in every school and every. What, what this has done is provided the parameters, has provided the uh, uh, comprehensive uh, conditions, and we the the, the, the um, standards you have to reach are set by the governing body of each individual interest, so they know what they're talking about. Whereas before, um, people tended to set their own. Uh, parameters and their own conditions. Now you, you, they're set by people who know what they're, what they're talking about, know what, what is possible. But there have been other things that he has done that people haven't noticed. He's had a Commonwealth conference taking place every few years, since the 1950s, where thoughtful people have got together and tried to worry through a problem. So there are all these interests that he had that are beyond the public domain. He's been involved with something like 800 organisations over the years. Philip was not just a figurehead for all these charities and, 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 and organisations that he was associated with. He really, really put in the legwork. I mean, I remember when Ascot, the race course, was being redeveloped. The developer and the architects, they knew that they had a problem with crowd management in one small area and they absolutely couldn't work out how to solve it. But they thought, well, we'll show the, you know, the day had come, we will present what we have. And the, the, the Queen and the, the whole party looked at this presentation and at the end of it, Prince Philip very quietly said, of course, you realize you're, you've got a problem with crowd control just in that point. And he had picked up the very thing. It was a tiny point, a tiny piece, but he had picked it up. And his attention to detail is, has been extraordinary. All these, the societies and organizations he's worked with have said exactly the same thing. He's not just a figure on the, on the, um, the note paper. Tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. <laughs> tolerance was the key to, their, to the success of their marriage. And my goodness, you know, I'm sure that over the years, each one has had to be tolerant of the other. Yesterday, I listened as Prince Philip spoke at the Guild Hall, and I then proposed our host's health. Today, the roles are reversed. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand, and as you will imagine, 
his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> he is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. The influence a person has, not the power, the influence. If you're talking to the monarch regularly and she's listening, she hears what you say. She hears what the prime minister says. She hears what her advisers say. But there's this man giving his opinion. So he's been an immense influence on her life. The Duke of Edinburgh has um, been by nature very self-effacing, but also as a consort, he has never sought to be in the limelight or to be the, the main attraction, if you like. He very much understands that people want to see the Queen um, and he's always there to support them in that. I mean, that's how he saw his task from day one. And that's what he wrote famously to King George VI when he said he would honour and obey and cherish, cherish was the word he used, um, Lilibet, but mainly that he would support her. And that's, that's his job. He wrote the job description him, himself. Whether it's, you know, lifting small children over the barriers, which he was still doing at the age of 94 on the Queen's 90th birthday in Windsor, um, he has very much ensured that his wife is the main focus and everything he has done has been in support of her. So when you have him, for example, joking that he's the world's most experienced plaque unveiler, it's a, a real sort of insight into how he views himself. He, he doesn't want any fuss. He doesn't want any attention. He just wants to get on with things quietly. We've not seen the world's most experienced plaque unveiler. <laughs> Once toward when he was getting on quite a bit, somebody on a foreign tour um, accused him of nodding off during a presidential visit. And he said, yes, possibly while the president was speaking, but not while Her Majesty was speaking, I assure you. Uh, and uh, he, he never failed the Queen, simply never failed the Queen. Our number one institution may not have been so solid and, and have lasted quite in the way it has, um, without that great support that he gave his wife. You know, history will, will principally regard him as this sort of vital um, supporter of, of the Queen. He was this Greek god of a man. He is a matinee idol in his own right. With an incredible life story to tell. The man who props up the monarchy. He had enthusiasms in life beyond himself. All action hero who made people laugh. Prince Philip was a big character. He was absolutely a details man. Queen said, you know, that, that this country and many others owe him a debt of gratitude. There have been sort of wobbles along the way, but he, essentially now, you know, you really can't sort of fault him, you know, the service he's sort of provided. And I think without Philip, Queen Elizabeth would have been a lesser monarch and we'd have been the poorer for it. I think life without Prince Philip will be a very dreary place.